17, Wednesday the 1st, at the City Hall Complex. So I call this session uh, to order. And we have uh, three presentations today under communications. We'll go to the first one, A, uh, proposed DHA of Park Improvements and Design. Uh, Mr. Andre. Uh, I'll just introduce this real quick, Mr. Mayor, if that's all right. Good afternoon, Mayor, uh, members of the council. Uh, I just wanted to introduce this project on behalf of uh, Andre Ryu. Um, Dr. Felix and Marcel Bachelier and I have all been working together uh, per your recommendations in the strategic plan to look for uh, parks and recreation opportunities in the city of Nogales. Um, Techea Park was identified as one of those opportunities um, with a potential donor of the land. Um, towards the back half. Uh, we uh, collaborated with the University of Arizona and Andre Ryu is a recent graduate um, of the Masters of Landscape Architecture program there. Um, and it's great to have him down here. We've been working with him for the last couple months. Uh, he's really uh, given us some great concepts and he's here to present a, a final concept that he's uh, drilled down and kind of really finalized. Um, we think that it's very great and ultimately um, we, we thought it kept in, was in keeping with your guys' strategic plan goal, um, and we think it promotes um, Nogales as a place for imagination and creativity and ultimately uh, fitness opportunities and things like that that we'll get back to the community. So that said, I'll uh, hand it over to Andre. Hi, I'm Andre. Uh, Good afternoon, man. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to start by saying uh, it's really great to be able to present before the council and the mayor today. Um, this has been a great project. I've worked closely with uh, Dr. Felix, Frank Dillon, and another intern, uh, Isaac Palomo, who's uh, from the city of Nogales. Um, and it's been a good project to work on. Um, so getting into things today, uh, you know, I want to show you the design that's been generated over the past couple of months, but I'd like to start with some of the legwork. Uh, you've been doing a pamphlet, some scale drawings. A uh, pamphlet is, or the booklet rather, uh, is sort of a truncated version of this uh, presentation, so you can follow along with this presentation or uh, review it at your own time more in depth uh, uh, as you please. Um, so the first thing uh, that I'd like to show you is it's just a map outlined in color uh, on this map is uh, the general bounds that were given for THA of Park and possible expansion into that space. Uh, you can see the major roads uh, that are adjacent to it. There's two uh, prominent neighborhoods directly next to the site. One of them is uh, partially closed off due to the topography of the site being behind uh, south of the hill, um, and the other side uh, very much uh, in touch with the park. Um, at a more uh, intimate scale, site scale, uh, there are some issues that are visible um, in terms of the enclosure of the park. So uh, this park is actually, um, it's behind City Hall, uh, and the only place that you can see it from Grand Avenue is as you approach the intersection where the Chevron is. Um, and then aside from that, it's enclosed by the neighborhood and the hills. Um, one prominent feature that sticks out uh, on the site is there's a stand of sycamore trees that are in ex extremely good health, um, and they seem like an excellent park feature uh, that should be built upon. Um, so I selected this image uh, in particular because uh, through some research on social media, uh, it became evident that uh, one of the, the larger user groups of the park are parents of disabled children. This is a group uh, called SANS, which is the Southern Arizona Network for Down Syndrome. Uh, and there are several organizations similar to SANS, uh, which have annual events that meet at this park. Uh, and it seems like a user group that should be um, accommodated and looked into. And so that was sort of a guiding principle when developing a program uh, for this park. So this is a diagram that uh, sort of highlights the three main ideas that I felt needed to be addressed, which were accessibility, community, and resilience, where each of these things overlap, you have certain outcomes. So where accessibility and community come together, you have inclusion, where community and resilient materials are brought together, you have stewardship of the park, and where all three are brought together, you have increased usage, which is the end goal for the park. Um, so when you're writing a program, those are broken up into goals, uh, which are your desired outcomes, objectives, which are how you achieve your goals, and uh, the qualities and uh, elements of each of those. So each of these pieces represent a different goal, and each of these goals have three sub-objectives, 
and those objectives have been outlined with elements and qualities. The reason that I show you this is because uh, this provides a really easy framework for creating a design for the park, um, which lets us put pencil to paper, or trace, as the case is. Um, and I'll go through these briefly just because of the time constraints, uh, but some of the early concepts involved uh, making accommodations for youth soccer uh, and a pedestrian bikeway which ran through the park that had multi-purpose. A more truncated view of not expanding the park, but uh, making the best of the amenities that are there, expanding on the natural area, and reducing the overall turf. But ultimately, the concept that was met with uh, the most enthusiasm um, basically revolved around the idea of implementing a fitness loop, a track, a quarter mile track uh, on Teachia Park, where you have different activities that exist inside of that loop and on the exterior. Um, so this was developed, um, you know, over the course of eight weeks into something uh, a lot more than just these bubbles here. Um, and so we'll sort of get into that. So we'll address this from left to right. Um, one of the things that's on the table for this is that there uh, is the possibility of a donation of land to the city. Um, and uh, part of that is the inclusion of a new amphitheater. Um, and so on the far left, you can see uh, item number one. That is the new amphitheater. It's nested into the hillside, uh, and it's accommodated by additional parking and another 25 spaces um, that uh, make use of a split level and a one-way uh, lot. Um, item number two uh, are improvements to the basketball court. Currently, the volleyball court is dilapidated and um, in disuse. Uh, this moves the court over and nestles it inside of the fitness loop um, and adjoins it with uh, two grass viewing lawns. Uh, directly beneath that, item number three, there is a nature walk which goes through the hills. Uh, and so this nature walk, uh, a lot of time was spent making sure that the grades of uh, the, the paths would be acceptable for, for use. Um, and it's connected in five places in total, so three into the site and two exterior to the site, bringing the connection from outside of the hillside. Uh, item number four, uh, if you're following along, is uh, that's a ramada. Um, and so there are five shade structures on site uh, that accommodate various numbers of, um, of tables. The one down there in the bottom accommodates the most at nine tables. Uh, and then we also have two and four and one ramada, which is completely open so that um, there are no tables underneath um, that allows people to bring what they want to that location. Um, you know, you could have a dance underneath that. You could set up booths. Uh, for special events, all sorts of things like that. Um, item number five is a small footbridge. And so item number five moves directly through that stand of sycamore trees that stand in the park. Um, and that footbridge goes over a series of detention basins, which are intended to capture runoff from the hill. Um, because this does sit in a floodplain, slow that water down and let it percolate and improve the health of the trees. Um, item number six uh, refers to uh, the quarter mile running track. Uh, it's two lanes. Uh, it's ideally out of rubberized asphalt like you'd see on a high school track. Um, it's about eight feet wide, which accommodates most service vehicles. Um, and along each, you'll see these small uh, purple circles uh, outside the edge. And those purple circles are fitness stations um, where people can engage in uh, different exercises like sit ups or pull ups uh, along that, uh, that area. Number seven um, is the the Great Lawn. Uh, it's a sunken lawn. Um, you can see the slopes that are implied uh, by the shading and some small contours, with one side being steeper than the other and a much gradual, much more gradual slope uh, from the entrance of the park. Um, and number eight, nestled in between the original walkway that exists in the park, the only sidewalk that exists in the park, and the rest of the track, is a handicap accessible play area uh, on top of rubberized uh, materials with partially shaded by the existing trees there and partially shaded by a proposed state structure. Uh, if we move on, um, unfortunately, these aren't labeled. But if we go from top to bottom, it's A, B, and C, with A and A prime left to right, if you're looking at the site key. Um, you can see that the amphitheater is nestled into the hillside. Uh, and then you can also see the split division between the two levels of the proposed parking area with a detention basin in between the two and an entry into the park. Uh, in section B, you can see where it cuts across the entirety of the smaller circle on the site. 
uh, moving through the track. The viewing long faces into the basketball court. The um, a continuation of the track on the other side, another <coughs> fit station, the footbridge that brings people up a little bit into the tree canopy and over the detention basins, followed by another fit station and uh, the rest of the track. Finally, section C, which runs from the northwest to the southeast side of the, uh, of the main bowl. You see the track at the far end, the steeper side of the slope. Uh, we only go down about three feet uh, there, so you can see that people are still above uh, like knee level uh, where, where their eye line is at. And then a much more gradual slope from the playground and the sidewalk. So you can see the original sidewalk there going into the handicap accessible playground. And then uh, to deal with the hillside slope, um, there's a small detail in there where it's, uh, it's a retaining wall and a seating wall that faces into the playground. Uh, just to show you some of the materials uh, and the color scheme uh, of the palette. The color scheme is not just for the presentation. I feel that these colors uh, could be applied in the park for a very vibrant contemporary look. Um, some of the materials that we'd look at are the pathways would include rubberized track like previously discussed, stabilized decomposed granite for the nature walk, and concrete sidewalk everywhere else uh, where possible. Um, ground covers would be a limited amount of turf, and this image is key here uh, because I wanted to discuss the idea of when you create an edge for turf, you increase its value. So when turf is confined to smaller spaces, people uh, take better care of it, and um, it's more attractive and something that people arrive to instead of a blanket coverage um, and a waste of resources. Um, the basins would be rock mulched, and the play surfaces would be the typical rubberized play surfaces that you see near playgrounds. Uh, gathering spaces range anywhere from intimate seating areas like a concrete picnic bench to the shade structures that are proposed. And you'll see that in some of the perspectives there are different uh, visualizations for what the larger shade structures could be. They could be simple, rustic um, park shade structures where you have like a wooden ramada, or they could be something more contemporary along these lines. The specialty equipment, you can see that the fitness station is really simple. Um, really, it's, it's a little bit of metal work to allow people to do uh, specialized exercises. And I also wanted to emphasize that just because uh, handicap, just because play equipment is handicap accessible doesn't mean that it's uh, lesser play equipment. You can see that that looks like a fully equipped jungle gym, but it's accessible to a broader audience. Uh, and finally, the amphitheater that I proposed is pulled from a project which has a similar amphitheater where it's four levels of grass that face a stage enclosed by a retaining wall. Uh, that's in Philadelphia, but it, is appropriate here. Um, so on plant materials, I wanted to go back to the idea of edge. So you may have seen in the plan view that there are a lot of um, naturally vegetated areas. Um, and something that I'd like to emphasize is that when you create edge, you create a sense of uh, containment. Uh, this is a picture of a yard in Tucson. Uh, it's the yard of Brad Lancaster, who's sort of a water harvesting guru in Tucson. And so he has this really wonderful, wild looking landscape that feels contained and maintained. Um, this graphic on the right was made by uh, intern Isaac um, Palamo, and uh, he did some great work that really we pulled from a lot of different natural vegetation that would be uh, successful here in Nogales um, at different levels of watering needs and at um, different levels of use. Um, so I actually took Isaac out and I, uh, I got him trained on a drone, so we got some uh, drone photography, and now he can do that. He's completing the same program that I just finished in May, uh, so now he'll be able to apply this to his studies. Um, and so this is a visualization of how that looks over the existing space. You can see the parking lot for City Hall over there. Uh, you can see, you know, a ton of new trees. We're looking at the Great Lawn. The fitness track is a very strong edge to contain that grass. Uh, and we have the consolidated play area, which uh, is more broadly accessible, not only because of the equipment, but because of its proximity to the parking lot. Um, so this would be directly opposite. You can see there's another site key down in the bottom right. Uh, uh, the top right of the screen is the art gallery that sits atop the hill that looks over the park. Um, and you can see the basketball court and the dilapidated volleyball court. Um, and now you can see sort of how that amphitheater fits nestled into the hill. And it's really working with the topography there. And you can see that we have a split level parking lot that uh, again is working with topography that exists. Um, and the improvements to the basketball court with the, uh, uh, with the viewing lawns 
the track around it. You can see a couple of fitness stations, a bathroom to accommodate the increased use of the park uh, because of the amphitheater, uh, and another ramada. Uh, so these perspectives look uh, from the three different entrances of the park. Um, so here would be the entrance from City Hall. You can see the track, the sunken lawn, uh, the drainage way out to its natural uh, uh, outlet. Uh, that's where it flows out of the parking lot currently. Uh, the new Ramada. Um, this is the, uh, sorry, that's the northwestern entrance of the park. This is entrance from the neighborhood. That entrance is really just a two foot gap in the fence with some shrubs. So we'd want to improve that, but you can see those improvements laid over the top of that. You can see the bollard lighting that would surround the track, keeping it illuminated. Um, the playground in the background. And then the final entrance at the western end, uh, looking at the currently defunct volleyball court, uh, and then supplanting that with the relocated basketball court, fitness station there in the foreground, the bathroom in the background, the nature trail, you can see where it goes up to the amphitheater. Um, Isaac generated some more of these excellent diagrams that sort of extrapolate the different layers of the site. So we're looking at um, the different kinds of vegetation, the different areas where water is being collected on site, slowed down and sunk into the ground, put to better use. Um, and then over here you can see circulation, the different intensities of, excuse me, the different intensities of ground cover, um, the vegetation, proposed lighting. Uh, this is the diagram that shows the uh, the topography is overlaid on the uh, hillside. So in the um, cyan arrows on the hillside, you can see where water is shedding off. And then where each of those arrows is broken up, the dark blue ones, um, those would be areas that they would be collecting in different uh, sections with the proposed design. Um, and to sort of tie this all together, I've put together a phasing diagram. And the phasing is really simple on this. You would start with the uh, stormwater treatments and additional vegetation. Then you would move on to the track, the site equipment like ramadas, lighting poles, um, uh, most of the paved surfaces, and then uh, cap it off with the improvements to the 200-seat uh, uh, amphitheater, the parking lot, and the nature trail system. Um, so you know this is a design proposal. It's open for comment and revision. Um, you know I'd like to open it up for questions. Uh, but before I do that, I'd just like to say I've been very fortunate in working on this project, and I hope that I can continue to in some way. Thank you. Well, uh, Mr. Yes, uh, uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you. For that uh, theater, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if I heard you or if you mentioned, how, how much um, are, are we talking about accommodating? How many people are uh, So the request was to accommodate somewhere between uh, 150 to 200 people. Did you mention that in your presentation? Uh, I mentioned it very briefly in closing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and so the dimensions on that amphitheater are based off of um, uh, giving people a certain uh, square footage because it's mm -hmm. open seating on the lawn. Uh, and so it works out to a, like a 16 square foot per person inside of that area. So it's like a, a four foot, a four foot area. That and what type of activities would you plan for that amount of? Well, um, so something that I've heard that happens currently in park is that there's like movie night in the park. Um, so that would be one small activity, but I think the idea would be that uh, you'd be able to book uh, events, gatherings, uh, you know, uh, musicians. Um, I'm not entirely, um, I haven't programmed entirely the, Did the you do a events. background on the activities that have taken place in that park previously? Uh, well, I've looked into different organizations that meet at the park. Um, uh, but the, any of the events that have taken place there and what the populations there are. Like, is it, isn't there one, for example, uh, Mayor, where they bring the law enforcement here? And well, that's, yes, we have the, the night out, uh, which is around September. But uh, aside from that, we do have, uh, and, and this this year I haven't seen it, but we normally, uh, in the summer, we have those uh, uh, free movies that uh, I think Circles of Peace uh, is involved in, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Doctor. Yeah. Well, what's the population uh, for that? I mean, if we're going to put a, 
it would just seem to me that if you're going to put an amphitheater there, you should have more or less an idea of the activities you're going to have and what previous populations are of events. I mean, it, it looks real nice, but we don't want, want it just sitting there. And yes, there'll be some events that we can use it for, but we want, we want something that we're going to put, that we're going to put some money in there. And, and, and that we've already had activities previously that we can say, we can do this, and this is where we can have it. Uh, Councilman Rojas, the, the intent was to have a plan, uh, meet with the community and talk about their perceptions of what utilizations could be, mm -hmm. and then come back and make some adjustments as the community says, this is what we'd like to see, uh, as opposed to that. And, and uh, one of the things that they wanted to see was is, uh, soccer fields, practices for right. little kids, and soccer and t-ball. So this accommodates that, uh, and for small games like that. So we just still need to do the, the analysis and, and go to the community, especially that neighborhood, and talk about what would they want to see, and then the groups in town as to what uh, utilization. So it's a plan you're kind of working with and an getting some process, feedback. Right? and uh, You know, uh, and that's what I would like. I would like to have some numbers, some activities, activities that have been done in the past, and maybe some activities that you foresee in the future so that we can accommodate the different organizations as well as the city. Councilman uh, Ross will also meet with the school district to see how they might utilize the park as well. Mm -hmm. Because if it's a good uh, amphitheater that we can use there, then we can also apply it somewhere else with a bigger uh, population. Good. So I, I was okay. curious. Uh, I was curious about the seating of the amphi. Uh, how, how, actually, if you could give a little more detail on chairs. No. Yeah, actually, so I'd probably bring this back to. There we are. Um, let's see if I can zoom in here. So there we are. Um, so what you're looking at is uh, essentially it's open seating, like lawn seating. Uh, each of the slopes of those is a very gradual slope that's acceptable for mm -hmm. elevating uh, people's viewership of the stage. Um, and uh, the sizing of that has been accommodated for the requested number uh, between 100 and 200, 200 people. Uh, so people could be sitting out there with blankets. Um, you know, if people wanted to bring out picnic chairs, you know, maybe if we'd ask them to, to sit at the back so they're or not disturbing other views. What's that? Or little cushions that they could use on. Uh, during sporting events, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and the reason I, I ask is, uh, is on that actual seating, it, it would seat up to about 200 people? Uh, yes. Oh, okay. Would, would, it, would there be any standing room to the side during like that? Or say um, it was a bigger event that, say, it exceeded the 200, say we have 300 mm -hmm. people, would they still be able to... Be able to so... This particular amphitheater has been sized to accommodate uh, our, that particular number. The size of the amphitheater, the design of the amphitheater, I think, would go back to what Dr. Felix was talking about, where um, if we were to to go with something, we would want to know the size of the events that we were having and to accommodate accordingly. Um, so this is a proposal at a particular number, um, but that number could be flexible, and because of that, the, the design and the buildup of that would have to it'd, it'd be that. kind of strange, I think, if it, was, if it exceeded that number. Uh, most of the events would be probably under that, a little under it. But I was just thinking in case we needed to do a bigger, something that would that might be of some overflow, would we be able to, to handle that there? I think that if you did want to host an event that had overflow outside of that, um, that the, the, let's see here, the grass bowl, here would be able to accommodate well, events like okay. that. It already has a natural slope built into that. Mm -hmm. It's in a nice container being, you know, set inside of the track. And, and we um, could put seats out there or chairs or something without messing up too much the, the lawn. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure that there is some amount of maintenance that would need to go with that, but it would be, it would be an accommodating so, use of it. And right. also that's like, the point of grass. Is like if we had a small concert or something and all that brings in a track people. 
Uh, I'm just, you know, like I said, I think I think 200 will fill the needs, but just in case if there's overflow, it's good to know that that there is something on the side there that that people can make themselves comfortable. In. Oh, absolutely. Well, and in addition to that, there are ramadas that are scattered throughout. We have that one ramada that's open, um, so that there's not tables underneath, and so you know you could have potentially different stations for an event set up around this track. Um, it would be very flexible in that sense. Well, I think uh, I think it's, it's probably more than what we envisioned. Uh, it seems to be a well-designed uh, design concept here of uh, how, to, how to make get multiple use of that uh, amphitheater. Uh, I don't know if uh, Councilman Diaz has also that in mind. Well, actually, we were kind of just hoping to have one, but it <laughs> seems to be well, well planned out. So I, I got a couple questions here. On, on, on the, you know, thank you for, for doing this and coming down and uh, putting your time and energy into this project. It's, it's very nice. We've never had something like this in Ogallis. So it's going to be our prototype. It's going to be our start. So, you know, I, I like the concept. I like the, the, just to have it, you know. that. Uh, so this would be our, our prototype. So on the amphitheater itself, you can accommodate 200 people. But would you leave areas for, uh, like, make it bigger for adding on to it later on if the need arises? I mean, we got to start somewhere, and this is a good start. So uh, as the need arises, if, uh, if, it, if, if it's a totally big success and, you know, you want to have a rock band there, you want to have the kids doing a, a, a Christmas concert, uh, the Mexican consulate doing their the Cesar Septiembre and all that, uh, would you leave area, an area so it could be expanded so without too much trouble, you know, like for future use? If you look at the natural topography of the site, mm -hmm. uh, this is currently nestled in a little bit of canyon, but because it, um, it that slope continues across, it'd be very feasible to, to look at uh, redesigning maybe so that it's not that enclosed state, so that it was maybe something that was, you know, Added that could be extended out or extruded out into the landscape would be very possible. Councilman Diaz, one of the other concepts we have is instead of building a stage, that we would look at a portable stage that could be a, a semi that breaks down into a stage. It could fit into that every in the seventh, and you can have, it could be wide open, but uh, rather than build a stage with all the uh, regiments that you have for uh, electrical and all that, a portable stage could be moved to such a field here. And so it, it's it's a it's a good start, very good start. To to do something for our residents and you know something for the kids in the community to look forward to wanting to come over and and having some fun. Team well defined. Councilman Maldonado. I saw one. There's one in San Diego where uh, it's very similar, <laughs> but on the the walls. Are lower, and they have the option of uh, of uh, cement at different levels, where they could put uh, bleachers. Mm -hmm. mm. Oh, like oh cement, like I see what you're saying. Yeah, thing. I would add to the expandability yeah. of it. Mm -hmm. They could be, you know, removed from site if necessary. Yeah. Or, yeah. And they and they had it like uh, with the canopies and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You know, so. I think that would be a good idea to give it the option of, of putting leakers or stuff like that with a little, maybe a, a lower wall. It's a great project. Great. Uh, thank you for taking the time and uh, and doing this, Andre. Uh, you know, turning this thing into a Disneyland. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, yeah. Uh, Councilman Lucero. Yeah. Sorry, sorry for being late, but... Uh, from what I saw, it looks great. Is there any possible way you can come up with a general ballpark in terms of cost of what we'd be looking at for something like this, so at least we can start to get it in our, in our minds to, to prepare for, for trying uh, to come up with the funds to do something like this? So at this point, I've been asked to uh, really develop this design from the concept uh, that there was like a pencil on, on mm -hmm. trace um, up to that. Uh, I think it's possible uh, for me to continue to work on that. It might be something that uh, Frank or, or um, the people would, would look to or possibly, um, yeah. At, at this moment, I couldn't give you a ballpark. Just, just so I can get an order of magnitude, just so we, because yeah. we'll be going into the budget process here in 
early next year and it'd be nice to know what, what to prepare for. Or at least we can put something aside so we can start looking at trying to implement some of the stuff that, that you have there. Councilman Buscetta, one of the things we'll do is we'll, we're going to cost it out by the three stages that he mentioned and then uh, decide which stage we go first, but we'll work on those figures. But first we have to do the community uh, survey to see what can be added to the and how, how receptive the neighbors are going to be to it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Anyone else on the council that has a question? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I really enjoyed your goal number three. And my thing is for our community to learn as much as they can about having green, yeah. recyclable, things that can be reusable out on that part. And, and I really enjoyed that goal three. On your uh, objective number two, you, you made a, a comment there that says, must show sponsorship for management by community. What does that mean? Uh, so that was an early objective that was put in. One of the things that was uh, brought up in a lot of, that probably should have been uh, edited just a little bit, but um, we discussed the inclusion of a community garden uh, into mm -hmm. the park, and that was something that was present in all three concepts. The issue with community gardens is, is that they do require um, extensive sponsorship by the community in terms of if you don't have somebody that's actively managing a community garden, they fall into disrepair. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea of having user buy-in, of having people that care about the park and that are using it daily, um, well, there's still an element of sponsorship in that. Um, you know, when you have people that visit and frequent a site, uh, there is care taken towards that site. And concerned citizens raise concerns if, you know, things aren't being taken care of or they do something about it themselves. Um, and so I guess that would be what it is, is, is buy-in. Yep. Also, this. Uh Handicapped accessible playground. Yeah. Wonderful, because I don't think we really have a, a, a playground here mm -hmm. that meets the needs of the special ed students, especially the profoundly special ed students. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, especially when you can get the special ed student to go ahead and be mingled in with the regular people, they feel, those students don't feel that there's a set of playgrounds for them and another set for the other kids. And I think that's an excellent idea. Absolutely. On your rubberized track there, yeah. you said that it's eight feet wide. Yes. Uh, and enough room for vehicles. A service vehicle. So okay, you, you a know. service vehicle. But we've done that with a service vehicle mm -hmm. on the, the running track at the high school football field. Okay. And all it does is deteriorate. The, that one quarter of a mile is just like one lap around. The football field. That's correct. And we have those vehicles that get onto that track, and they just that track is probably going to cost at least three or four hundred thousand dollars rubberized, just the track itself. And putting vehicles on it diminishes the value of that. Right. So that would be something that would definitely need to be spec'd out differently. Then I'm glad that you brought up that concern. Um, so you know I can edit these materials so that they don't include. The, uh, rubberized material. Um, did you have an alternative? Uh, did you have, were you prepared for yes. an alternative? An alternative material? Yes. Uh, so I would recommend plain asphalt in that case if that's a concern because asphalt holds up to regular uh, wear and tear. Um, you know, you can still paint that surface. Uh, painted asphalt uh, is not an issue. You can keep the, uh, you know, very bright color uh, that you have here. Yeah. And it's not hard on them to walk on or run on. Yeah. And so, you know, that's actually a point that I, I should have brought up about um, bringing this into accessibility. Having this loop, which goes around the entirety of the park, um, you know, uh, when I've been, I've been on a couple of site visits out here really early in the morning, and what I see are you've got, you know, a couple of, of groups of uh, the, those that are, like, out there. And, um, you know, Elder, they... Not the keepers, elders. <laughs> um, a lot of Marcy's running around. <laughs> the, um, but there, like, there's this couple that I watch <coughs> where they've got that one strip of sidewalk, and all they are doing is they're walking back and forth on that single strip of sidewalk because the rest of the park isn't, you know, on on level surface. And so having that track makes the entirety of the park accessible to, um, you know, that 
portion of the population. Andre, it's a great beginning. It gives us some, some vision for it, and I, and I thank the staff uh, for bringing this vision in, in conjunction with our strategic plan, because we spend a lot of time on the strategic plan, and I'm glad that the three of you are bringing things that give from the direction of this park would just enhance the quality of life of, in our community. You did a good job on that. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Any other comments from the council? No. Thank you. Thank Great you. Job. Andre, thank you. Great job. So much. Great job. Thank you, Mr. Break. So now we go into uh, B. Pestamos or Pestamos promotes positive change and self sufficiency to enhance the quality of life for the benefit of those who we serve. Pestamos, uh, a subsidiary of CPLC, Chicano por la Causa. And uh, I guess we have uh, the first person up. Uh, do you like to welcome uh, Dr. Frank Betty? Mm -hmm. uh, Mayor, I'd like to, the Chicago for La Casa was established in 1969 in Phoenix, and since then, they've grown to the largest non-profit non group in the country. Mm -hmm. Right now, they currently serve over 250,000 uh, individuals annually from Arizona, Nevada, and New Mexico. And they, they provide a comprehensive range of bilingual, bicultural services, focusing on health and services, mm -hmm. housing and education, and more importantly, economic development. So I'd like to introduce Dave Adame, who is the president of uh, CPLC, and uh, he'll, he'll take it from here. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Good to see you guys. I've seen some of you guys recently at different events, so it's nice to be here in Nogales. And I'm especially excited to be here, because just as a personal note, my wife was excited because she's actually from uh, Nogales, Sonora. So she asks me every now and then, so what are you doing in Nogales? So you guys have somebody who's going to keep the pressure on me and, and make sure that we're going to start doing more in Nogales. Good. But I've been the CEO a little over two years now of Chicago's Pola Causa, and something I'm very proud of. And you know, thank you, uh, Dr. Felix. We, our numbers are actually, uh, our last official number of people that we've actually impacted, is what we like to say, is over 304,000 people, uh, primarily in Arizona, but with the new states, Nevada and New Mexico, that, that number continues to grow. We believe the number at the end of this year, which ended 6:30, our fiscal year, will probably be in the 360,000 people that we serve. Uh, my board has put a, a big, uh, I like to call it, hairy audacious goal on me by the end of our seven-year plan, which we're in our third year of, that that number will be 1.5 million people wow. that we serve. So they keep us on our toes. You know, I'm the ex-banker, so I'm always talking about the numbers and how we're doing there. But then they say, well, why, why are you here? Why are we here? Why were we started? And that's to serve the people. And that's the thing that we're going to focus on. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. Before we get into that, uh, I have our, our Southern uh, Arizona president, market president, uh, which includes uh, Nugales. It's going to come in, but we're going to introduce the staff. And then from there, we'll, we'll get started our presentation, if you don't mind. All right. <coughs> Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to be here today with you all. Uh, there's been several conversations with many of the individuals here over time and at e different events, and uh, we're just really grateful to have your time, as I, as I know you're very busy. Uh, that being said, we brought several of our team members, so I would like to uh, create sort of a formal, excuse me, informal atmosphere within your formal atmosphere, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. uh, for us, whiteboard sessions work very well uh, because it's brainstorming and it's really sharing of information, learning of community needs, and that is what we do, and we do it well. And um, we're proud of that. We're not boasting, but we're, we're really excited about possibilities with the city of Nogales. That being said, I'd like to go ahead and have our staff, each of our staff, stand and introduce themselves and just let you know the region and the area in which they work. Thank you. I'll stand first and uh, is it okay if I just... Is that okay? So, Herman Reyes, I oversee all of the Chicago Black House of the State, which is uh, very significant in the state of Arizona. We have about 3,000 units in multifamily and about 300,000 
It would help though if you use the microphone because they're streaming it so the people know who you are though too. So my name is Herman Reyes. I'm the executive vice president. I report to David Adame. I oversee our real estate operations, which uh, is inclusive of multifamily, some single family now, and definitely some land. And um, we definitely have some land here in Nogales, which I would um, definitely have some uh, suggestions for wh what we might want to do there. Uh, but we have a very significant portfolio of multifamily, about 3,000 square feet, uh, 3,000 units, some of which are, are here in Nogales, our Mount Point One and Mount Point Two tax credits. And then um, also have about 300,000 square feet of commercial space. And I think that's one of the areas where we think there's significant opportunity here in the city because of some of the uh, potential opportunities that exist. And not to steal anybody's thunder, I'm not sure what everybody else is going to say, but I think there's a lot of opportunity right now given some of the federal funding that has been allocated for opportunity zones. I think there's um, an awful lot of property here that maybe can be designated and maybe under some, some mechanism, financial under an opportunity fund. I think there's a, there's a, we can probably aspire to do a lot with the city. We would need the city's participation, of course, but um, I'll stop there because I think this as a whiteboard session. I think there's an awful lot that we can do in terms of some some communication back and forth and some sharing some ideas. So um, some of the folks on my team are here, and uh, I invite them to come up and introduce themselves. Good afternoon, Mayor, uh, members of council. Uh, my name is uh, Nick Smith. I'm the vice president of real estate development uh, under real estate operations at Mom. Uh, I oversee uh, our real estate development, uh, new construction, acquisition, rehab <coughs> in, uh, here in Arizona, uh, as well as our divisions in uh, Nevada uh, and New Mexico, and then obviously our, our big self-help uh, shop by program that we run here in the whole portion of the state. Thank you. Council. I'm Jim Brooks. I'm a project manager for the uh, Council for La Casa, but also for La Casa Construction, our, uh, our for-profit construction arm. So I do work down here in Nogales. We're building housing right now. And um, some in Tucson, but certainly I agree with what Herman said, is that you know, commercial looks to be something we could do, and certainly some multifamily. There's so many opportunities. Hello, my name is Corina Fraboso. I'm the Rural Development Director here in um, the Nogales Office of Chicanos por la Causa. Um, we have actually been working with the Golf Help Program here in Nogales since 1995. We built about 278 homes. Um, those homes are to target low-income families. We started the Shop Light Program about two years ago to target also moderate-income families, and we're looking to expand with the help of the city to start targeting additional uh, brackets of income or continue targeting low-income families here in Ogales. Hi, Mayor. Thank you. Hey, council members. Thank you so much, Manager. Um, I'm Emilio Gaynor. I represent Business Enterprises Division of Chicanos por la Causa. I'm here representing John Ramirez, the Executive Vice President. Um, business Enterprises oversees all of the business lending section, which you mentioned, um, Mayor, the Preston section, uh, equity investments, uh, business development, and um, supports all of the different areas of Chicanos por la Causa as it relates to um, what we've talked about here is investment, empowerment, and um, economic self-sustainability, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and I'd just like to recognize an independent consultant that worked with us many times, Cesar Ferdusco, who, who worked with us. So our offices here in Nogales are located at 575 North Grand Avenue. That's where we've been there. We were actually further down the road on, on Grand for many, many years, but I think about eight years ago we, we moved into the new offices there. Our Mountain Point uh, project that was uh, Hedmon mentioned is at 800 East Baffert. That's that nice uh, apartment complex you have there by the school as you go up the street there and again the self-help program that's been going on so Chicago Pula Causa is about to celebrate its 50th year of existence and, and we're going to invite you all to the big party we're going to have in April of 2019 so we're excited about that but uh, with our board and the new leadership team and the new members uh, we changed our vision and just simplified it our, our new our new vision 
uh, is, is what's on the screen here. It's Empowered Lives. That's, that's what we do. And we do it in, in four different areas because we say in our mission statement, we drive economic and now political empowerment, and I'll talk a little bit about that. The four areas are the four pillars that we like to call them are economic development, education, health care, and housing which includes other real estate uh, that we want to talk about potentially is in partnership hearing. I've had some meetings with city manager about potentially some ideas that we had early June. But our, our strategy as a nonprofit has been that we try to be as, as self-sufficient as possible. So we have an operating budget, give or take, of about $100 million, give or take, overall. Of that budget, we generate about 55% of that through, uh, we have seven for-profit subsidiaries, uh, we have fee-for-service programs that we have that we were under contract, and our goal over the next now five years under our seven-year plan is to move that percentage from 55% self-generated to 77% self-generated. So as we partner with folks and we have these whiteboard sessions, so when somebody finally gets to the point working with us and say, "Well, David, how can how can we help the community? How can we work together?" We go to these whiteboard sessions, which is not as formal as this, but we'll we'll, we'll work through it. And we try to figure out what are the goals and objectives of the partner that we're, we're, we're talking to and what are, our, what are our strengths? What do we bring to the table? And we get those circles where they overlap and we, we kind of, in a fun way, say we try to find the pony. Where's the pony in there on, on the strategies that we're trying to do? And once we find that, we try to make it where it's a sustainable uh, solution to what we're trying to solve. I'll, I'll give you an example of, of a for-profit company that we worked with. It's got a, United Healthcare, largest healthcare company in, in, in the country. We sat down with them, and as we had our whiteboard session with them, some of their goals and objectives were how do we lower healthcare costs? And how do we better serve our communities? So when we finally had the chance to make our pitch in when they flew us out to uh, Minnesota, we came up with an ideal of these four pillars that I talked about, housing, education, all these things. And we cross-sectored those things. So we cross-sectored housing and healthcare because we knew, based on all the work that we've been doing over the 50 years, that we knew as a social determinant, housing is a key element on healthy outcomes for a family. If you don't have a safe place, quality place to call home, tough to have a good education, tough to have, tough to have good healthcare, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So fast forward, what we came up with is they made a $22 million investment in Chicago's public housing. And I say investment because we're, we try to find a ways that our partner wins, we win, and most importantly, our community wins, wherever we're working at. And it was $22 million. What we did with it was we bought two large apartment complexes near a clinic, healthcare clinic, that we co-branded with United Healthcare. With those dollars in Phoenix, we were able to buy 500 units between the two apartment complexes. And the idea is that we were going to set aside 20% of the units for any patient referral that United Healthcare would send to us. So somebody would go to an emergency room and after they talked to the social worker and they figured out, well, these, these folks don't have a, if you don't have a home, if you have any chronic disease such as diabetes, you don't have a place to put the, your insulin or any other types of medicine that you may have that need refrigeration, for example. And so we basically said we're going to take the, the return on investment on, on a typical real estate deal and we're going to add variables to it. And we, we're going to monetize the, the cost savings and every, everything else that we did. So at the end of the day, they're making a 20% return on investment. And I'll show you why. One of the first families that we moved into the apartment complex as a referral from them was a Navajo Nation family living on the nation, couldn't afford to live anywhere else. Unfortunately, have a very sick daughter, young family. United Healthcare was spending $300,000 a year on this particular family. And as we've studied, a lot of healthcare related costs are non medicine and treatment related. There are other things, transportation, other things. So they were spending money on helicopter rides more often than not from the nation to the Phoenix Children's Hospital and other things. And they couldn't provide home care because they lived on the nation, quality home care. So now they live in an apartment unit that we bought with their money about a 10 minute ride from the hospital. They're saving of that $300,000 a year, they're saving two thirds of that. So now they're saving $200,000. So just with that one family, 
that's the kind of cost saving, the kind of solutions and innovative solutions. So I tell you that story just to tell you that we're, we've come a long way as far as how do we work with partners? How do we come up with quality solutions? No matter what it is, we try to figure out how do we engage the private sector? How do we engage the public sector? And the, my team's going to talk about some others. But I think before we go forward, I think we had a couple of videos that we wanted to share. Do we have those teed up? Okay. So we're going to show you a couple of videos and then have some other staff come up. And at any time, you can ask any questions, of course. Thank you, Dave. This is a United Healthcare clinic that we co branded. next video we're going to take a look at is that of our lending program, Prestamos.
So as you can see from those examples, that's how we empower lives in, in the four pillars. The, the fun thing about Alvia there at the end, she had gone to many banks and nobody would give her a chance, right? She was a, a rod uh, with her parents when, when they came, uh, when she was very young. She'd gone to, uh, to community college, but then with our, our current environment that we have in the state, the cost was going to be too much, so she dropped out and then started to work at Pet Boys for a while, being a cashier. Got bored with that, so somebody said, well, why don't you go get your beautician's license? She did and went to work for somebody, and she got bored with that and said, well, why don't you open up your own salon? And then when she opened up her salon, she was having trouble finding quality hairdressers that she felt good about. And then she said, well, well buy beauty college. So she found one. That's when the banks wouldn't take that next step with her. But, you know, she didn't have a lot of collateral and, and things that a typical bank that would look at. But we saw the value in her. We saw the, the experience she had, the commitment she had, and we wanted to give her a chance. So we made her a loan. I believe that loan was about 250000 if I remember right, Emilio. It's about a $250,000 loan for she could buy an existing beauty college and now I think she's opened up other locations she's trained over 500 students to get the beautician's license so the ripple effect of the investment we made in somebody to empower her life and now how, how she's empowering other people's lives by getting those types of training and then as I mentioned as I described the United Healthcare video uh, the next step actually yesterday we celebrated because now we partnered with a group called Native Health which is a federally qualified health center a federally designation for primary care clinics, they are now under that same roof now as a partner with us, and we celebrated that yesterday. And the director of uh, Health and Human Services, I should say Indian Health and Human Services, the national director came out to help us open up that facility to provide health care. So I'm going to open it up with our with our members. Uh, Valerie, you're going to set it up on, and we're going to try to be as succinct as possible to be respectful of your, your all time. But just to throw out some uh, initial concepts of one, and I'm going to start with, I'm going to start with real estate because I know that's some of the big discussions. So, and Mon, I'm going to ask you and your team to come up and kind of tee up what you've been looking at as potential opportunities here. Saying, let Valerie, you had something else to set up. So as Edmond and team comes up, I just wanted to talk a little bit about today's uh, goals and objectives. Very simple. We, um, our goal today is really to introduce and connect and reconnect uh, with Chicanos por la Causa in the city of Nogales, share information, hope to make this somewhat of an informal conversation and dialogue so we can share and learn of your community needs in hopes that we can establish a foundation in, in which we can have a working relationship and establish a foundation for a solid partnership. Um, if, again, if that is what your community needs, uh, we believe we have the resources and wherewithal to be able to help you meet those needs of your community. Thank you. So with that, Herman, I'm going to ask, I know on the agenda we're um, a little behind here, so I'm going to ask everyone to just uh, shorten their, um, their um, presentation a bit so we can have some time for dialogue. Actually, I, I actually came just with a kind of an open, an open mind, right? Because I think it wasn't. This, it was really more of a whiteboarding session that, that I see. And um, we do have a couple of, of suggestions of some land that we've owned for a while that I thought Jim, Jim who's worked for us for a while, um, has put together along with along with Nick. Um, and Mr. Mayor, I don't know if you recall, but we met uh, a couple years ago when we actually had a good conversation about our Baffert land. Um, so. I have a few things that I do want to talk about, but we purchased this particular land, which is which is very close to the other multifamily that we own, um, with our NSP program, which I won't talk about because we can talk for hours about about our neighborhood stabilization program. This is one particular property that we land banked, and we now have to do something with it. So the federal government basically is requesting that we do something because we want to close out our grant. Um, this is a concept. It's been it's been a tricky one because it's very. It's, Oh, did you need an extra copy? No, no, we're fine. Okay. So um, it's been a tricky one because of the landscape, right? So we thought, you know, it took a while to figure out what was in our best interest. And at one point, um, to be brutally straightforward with you, we thought maybe a swap with the city would be in our best interest. Maybe we could, because the city, I think, does have or the need for access through it. So there was a, a, several ideas that were coming to us. I will tell you that very, very recently, I mentioned this kind of in my opening remarks, with the, with the, if you want to call it the advent now or this idea of opportunity zones, 
this land happens to be in a qualifying opportunity zone, which it, it changes my whole perspective on, on the opportunity here. And, and again, we're all learning about what that really means, but what that does look like it means is that we can entice investment that would come in because there's a, there's a tax incentive for investors to do so. Um, how we might be able to, to, you know, work together with the city, I think is really what's interesting to me is really getting together. And if it's something like this, this now becomes a very viable concept because I think monies can be attracted to invest. Um, the, the return on investment to an investor now, I mean, you can, you can actually start to monetize it because of the tax credits involved. I just think it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity now that really becomes a reality, okay? And I think Jim and, and Nick, Nick had done a wonderful job in terms of preparing a document. So that was just one of the ideas that I thought was, was very timely at this point. Um, I'll just switch, change gears unless you have a specific question about this one, right? But um, um, I, also, I also believe that part of what we talked about a couple of years ago, Mr. Mayor, was the fact that affordable housing was in, in such high demand. I think more so than now, it's, it's even more so. I mean, I mean, the real estate market has actually, in a way, boomed in the last two years. Unfortunately, people of, 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 of low resources are the ones that are left behind, right? So here we are again in a situation where not only are, are they left behind, but housing prices are going up, and how do we, how do we attain home ownership for them? Corina has done a wonderful job in running our self-help program. And what's interesting about the self-help program is, you know, families get together under a mutual program that really allows them to keep costs down. What we were finding two years ago is a lot of familias were coming to us saying, hey, we don't want to wait until mess is putting in it's, it's nine months, really, to try and get families together to make a, a property work. And it works, right? But it takes a long time. And for the, for the most part, people aren't willing to wait nine months because they're priced out of the market again, right, for one thing. So we did create a program after we talked a couple, two, three years ago that's been very successful, but here we are again. I think that what we're finding is that there has to be some additional funds that come in to assist folks. And what that is, I think that what I would suggest is that we consider how we could generate dollars in some other program and maybe move some dollars over to help subsidize some of those folks because there's a huge demand for housing. Um, and Corina, I don't know if you have anything specific on the self-help program, but we intend to continue to move it forward. We've had additional grant funding for it. Um, I just think that we probably need to consider how we can work together to address that demand. You know, we can continue to come in and build them because we do build those houses ourselves now under a different program. But we're, we're probably shy, I would say, 10% of the total development cost to really make it work and continue to perpetuate it. But the demand is there. And uh, two, three years ago, I think we talked about the ability to maybe work with um, home funding that would come in from the federal government to assist you. So, I'm sorry, was there a question? Yes, uh, Councilman Yeah. Is there a possibility where we can use CDBG funds to work with you to offset some of the infrastructure costs, that kind of stuff? Absolutely. So that's where I, I referenced the home funding. It's really probably the home funding, which is, is kind of the, the same bucket that comes from, from HUD. But home would definitely be something. CDBG, I'm not sure if you could use it for residential housing like that. But the answer to your question is, is you likely have the opportunity to move dollars from home to make that happen. And what we find is the economic impact of, of even a house is very, very significant, right? Especially when you consider the impact family has to the local economy. So even if it's a, a $10,000 home investment for down payment assistance, you really recoup back in terms of economic impact. And, so it, and it, at least with CDBG funds, I mean, they, they're funneled through through our COG, and I don't know if the, the the other HUD funding would go through the COG or if we'd have to make direct application for those. The CDBG, no, uh, HUD, yes. Okay. So I think the idea of affordable housing we're, we're learning a lot. I think Rio Rico and Nogales is a, is a beautiful example to the entire country on what can happen with self-help. And this new model that we frankly created, I mean, you, you, don't, you can't find self-help like if you Google it. We, we kind of created the concept because of the demand that we saw from neighbors wanting, you know, hey, we want, we want housing now, right? So we, we basically did it under our construction company. But again, what we're finding is folks are willing to, to pay a little more and whatnot, right? still shy maybe 10 15 percent of a total development cost and um jim jim i was going to ask you uh, what what is the approximate total development cost of a home under a self-help light program i don't know if you could stand up please it's about 150,000 right now so. which is still very impactful huh? if, if you can build a hundred fifty thousand dollar home I, I can do that across the country which is why folks are interested right but the folks that are wanting to buy most can only afford say 135,000 right so how do you come up with that 15,000 and we used to be able to do it under an NSP model these other types of models but um, you know that money 
is gone, right? So how do you do that? And again, the economic impact uh, is a good is a good reason why you do it because you do recoup the 15. But if, how do you get the 15? Right? And I'm just throwing 15 out as a because it's 10 percent of 150. But there's a, the demand is huge in Nogales and in Rio Rico, which is which is here in our backyard, right? So, um, but but again, the self help program, the uh, Baffert land from an economic development and just a, a development standpoint because of opportunity zones. And then I know that we've also looked at um, development just in your in the inner city because I think there's an awful lot of opportunity for commercial development. And again, that qualifies for opportunity zone funding as well. Um, I'll, I'll stop there because I can keep going. But going back to the presentation or the discussion David had on the United Healthcare, the reason that really works is the model that we implemented is an 80-20 model that works with any partner. So 80-20 is really us coming to the table saying we don't need tax. We don't have to come to the table requesting tax credits. And actually, tax credits really put a hamper on, on your, your development also, right? Because there's a lot of strings attached to what you have to do. An 80-20 model simply says 80% of the units are market rate and can be market rate and provide the revenue to help subsidize 20%. So any mixed income model, which is really what we're all about, uh, we're really not about perpetuating poverty. We don't want to put 100% affordable housing anywhere. But if you can do market rate housing Generate a little profit. Again, we're a nonprofit developer. We don't need a 20% return. We just need a return on the 80%. You can use that to help subsidize maybe a self-help program or something like that, right? So it's that 80-20 model, I think, that we're finding uh, tremendous success on. Is there any on uh, these homes? I don't know if you do, but we lose a lot of federal law enforcement officers uh, out of this community because of housing. Is there anything in this program that has something yeah. for them? I would say absolutely. I would say that that um, when you look at the affordable housing programs that we've actually done, you know, you know, with the NSP program, it actually it actually mandates that you make you know certain earmarks, right? So you, you can you can absolutely say, hey, so you know the you know law enforcement or veterans or you know that's that's typically what can have a first right of refusal on contracts, right? Or f uh, lenders typically come in and offer programs that make it much more palatable for for that population to buy. So, and then I will also say that there's an awful lot of grant monies that we do receive. Home Depot is a good example. We got money from Home Depot just specifically to assist veterans. So if there's, if there's a place where we think we can create something where maybe law enforcement can be 20% of that of that complex, if we will, I think that we can actually, that's what CPLC is, is really good in doing. We can go out and find grant monies that can make it happen, but it's usually in conjunction with a municipality that really you know, has that has that requirement too, right? And then the picture is a really good picture you tell to your funders. But absolutely, I mean, I think that that's absolutely what you want to do. Okay. Any other questions or comments from the comments? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, I, and I guess this, I'll leave this design because we, we think there's a design there, Mr. Chair, that we could probably work, you know, maybe have a closer group discussion on what that could look like. Because I need to do something with that land. Yep. Right? Just because I, I need to get it. Not that I need to get it off our books, but I need to close out our grant, so I need to go back and tell HUD what I'm doing with that. And I can simply convey it to the city, but the city's not going to let me do that for nothing. So uh, <laughs> maybe uh, maybe some coffee or something. Trade it. Coffee. Trade it for coffee. <laughs> Thank you, Edman. Uh, next up is going to be Emilio Gaynor. He's our Director of International Development. He can tell you a little bit about the scope of his work and um, our Business Enterprise Division, and then we'll go o into an open dialogue Q&A session. Thank you. Again, thank you again for allowing me to address you. And, um, it is really a pleasure. Nogales, uh, I, I worked at, uh, as representative for the state of Arizona in Hermosillo many years ago for a couple of governors. And um, I always loved coming here because it's the real binational world. It's uh, uh, people know each other. They're growing up with each other. Families have been um, this, uh, they've had this relationship for way longer than some of the other parts of the state that think they're reinventing that uh, Binational relationships. So it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, our our division is a division that manages, well, oversees the Prestimos um, area, 
And one of the things that we've been trying to do is we've been trying to connect with companies that have an eye to the U.S., that want to come to the U.S., but know they're going to have some issues with financing because they don't have, no, they don't have any credit history or um, any experience in the United States. I'll give you an example of a recent company that we helped that uh, came to Phoenix. Uh, they were working with the city of Phoenix, and the city of Phoenix couldn't find a way to, uh, to provide uh, an opportunity for financing or investment. And uh, after they met with a couple of bankers, ultimately the city, a friend of the city, recommended that they talk to us. We looked at the situation, um, did some uh, due diligence, went to Mexico, look at make sure that they're actually an existing company, uh, make sure that they're actually fabricated the products that were fabricating, and ultimately, based on several um, items that we look at uh, when we uh, when we look at a loan, we decided that we could do this, uh, we could make this loan because the risk was worth uh, the reward, and. We ended up, in fact, making our biggest loan ever. We made a $1 million commitment to this company so they can manufacture plastic wrap in Phoenix. Um, this company decided on Phoenix because of the competitiveness in Phoenix. Uh, the transportation and other, other factors uh, provided them with a situation where they could uh, manufacture and sell their product in Phoenix at a very competitive rate compared to expanding in Mexico City. But if it wasn't for the, for Prestimos being able to provide a loan to them, they would not have expanded in, into the United States. What I'm here to talk to you about today is how we can do that in Nogales. We met with, um, and there's many other areas that I can talk to you about, but I think specifically this is an opportunity we can talk about right now. About two months ago, um, the Arizona-Mexico Commission uh, Philanthropic Committee, the community in the Community and Social Organization Committee had some meetings here in Nogales on the Mexican side and on the U.S. side. And one of the meetings happened at Nikki Kiriaki's home in Nogales, Sonora. What the Sonorans did is they invited the business people on the, Sonor on the Sonora side that do business in the U.S. to talk to them about how they can expand their business into Arizona, how, but how they can do that and being uh, socially responsible at the same time. Um, so the discussion was really about how these companies can be socially responsible, but the, but the discussion graduated into, hey, I'm investing in the U.S., and I'm investing with partners or whatever, but I've never invested with a nonprofit organization. And what Herman just talked about a few minutes ago was that what CPLC provides as a partner to the city of Nogales is that nonprofit benefit, that benefit where we don't have to exercise some of the tax benefits that a private company might demand or need. We can pass that on, in some cases, to these investors and developers that come from outside of the United States and invest in, in Arizona. Um, I want to open that up and kind of entice you into a discussion because I can't go completely into detail, but I can tell you that when an investor comes from Mexico, unless they have a really good partner that knows how to, you know, navigate the tax code and work with organizations that can help them benefit from um, opportunity zones and other things like that, then they just come in and invest. Why? Because they like to invest in the U.S. They protect their peso in dollars. They get a good return. Regardless of what happens with the peso, they are protected because the, their investment is in dollars. But when you show them that those 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 improved returns when you take into consideration some of the benefits that can be acquired through a nonprofit, then it really becomes um, something that they that they uh, that they desire and I would like to offer um, CPLC as a partner to Nogales to make this happen here in this region uh, many times when you look at that um, what is it the city of the, the state of Maricopa, right? Something like that. We call it down here. Um, people look to that world out there because they think that's the best place to invest. And in many cases, here, right here in Nogales, with a, you have Fresh Produce Association of the Americas, you have um, fresh produce transiting through this uh, border at record rates. Uh, yes, some of it uh, diminished, but 
um, I think we've, we're improving in Nogales. Some of the improvements that the federal government has made here as it relates to that border crossing, you know, those things are opportunities. And if you package it right, you can package it to these investors and entice that foreign investment directly into this area. Um, and that's, that's one of the things I'm here to offer. The other thing that, and there are many other things, but one other thing that our division um, manages, uh, business enterprise manages, is the area that where we seek federal grants that provide us the opportunity to invest in companies that create jobs. And I don't remember the last time we invested in a Nogales company, but we have invested in Tucson. So I'd like to see how we can better work with Nogales so that when we go after these uh, grants, we can include a Nogales company that has some um, future plans for hiring people or needs that little bit of capital to, um, to be successful and to hire people. So anyway, uh, those are the two things I wanted to share with you. We're, we're, I know that we're a little bit short in time, and I'm sure David's going to we want to jump in. We have one question here. Yes, go ahead, go ahead, uh, Mr. Lucero. Maybe two. From the hey, thank the you, Mayor. You mentioned that you know the, the state of Maricopa, and and, and I guess for for us in, in Nogales, Tucson is not representative of, of Nogales. And even though Tucson thinks that they are the port of entry to to Arizona, they are not. And I are. and I didn't mean to say that, Councilman. No, no, and I, and I bring it up only because I look at, at your your board representation, your committee representation. There's very little, if no, rural representation on on any of your boards or committees, and. And that's what I would point out. If you're looking for partnerships, you need to find ways to include rural Arizona onto some of your boards and committees. There's very talented people in the outlying area. I know Dr. Barona has plenty of free time and would volunteer to serve on any of your <laughs> committees. <laughs> Thank so, you, Mayor. So I'm sure that David will address that because we do have some committees, but you're right. I, we do need to. to <laughs> <laughs> to be better at that um, and you know I think another thing I want to mention is that we're lucky very lucky to have enticed Valerie to come uh, to join us because she really does know southern Arizona she knows Nogales and southeastern Arizona and um, I think it's this is the opportunity time for us I, I don't want this to pass by again um, when we have somebody of this caliber and this talent with us um, helping us navigate through this process. So thank you, um, Councilman. Yes, sir. Uh, go ahead, Doc. So you're right about that. Like, she she oh, brings yeah. a, a wealth of knowledge and experience from the Casino de Sol, and Casino de Sol has had a good relationship with various factors and nonprofits within our area here. But it would be nice if, uh, when you make this application or so, that you spend some time, because that's one of the themes of this council and our strategic and you have to turn on the mic. Yeah. Was to go ahead and enhance economic development. And as you're aware of, our, we, we don't have a property tax. We rely on sales tax. So we want to increase our economic development. We've tried some strategies with Santa Cruz County, and, and we start, and then it breaks down. And I think that this, we're starting off on a nice platform here where we could do some. And maybe the mayor, you could continue the dialogue with Dr. Felix on this, because I think this is an opportune time where we can help some of our local businesses to create jobs and market that idea to other people. Because unfortunately, a, a, lo a lot of the retail people kind of live in their own little world, and it's them and the banks. And the banks say no, and then they don't know what to do. And they don't know that grants are available, or they don't even understand the bureaucracy of the Small Business Administration. So I think this, this is a this is a good step, and you know, I, I really think Valerie uh, understands the, the the working environment here. But there's a lot of people here that want to expand, but really, they, even though they have that entrepreneur spirit, they don't know how to go out and expand. I hear Dr. Verona volunteering. No. <laughs> That's what I heard. No, you, you heard it correctly. Well, I, I appreciate those comments, and, and, and Councilman Lucero, you know, that, that's exactly why we're here, right? And, and well, the first thing that Valerie did, we, we met with, with Dr. Felix and, and tried to schedule this meeting as soon as possible. So we are committed. And, 
it's going to take uh, more dialogue, more sit down with staff and and others because because opportunities because our platform, you know, it's opportunity zone fund. You know, I don't forget if it's familiar, but the, it's basically a capital gains tax shelter, mm -hmm. right? And we are a U.S. Treasury community development financial institution, so we can self-certify and do that right away. So we can we can look to uh, if you have an economic council or, a, uh, or whatever the structure is here, we can even co-label a fund, Nogales, whatever, mm -hmm. CPLC opportunity fund, and we'll, we'll attract uh, capital gains investors to whatever the plans are here. We, so we want to know bigger plans. I saw one that was that was mentioned earlier, right? So we want to be able to look at these as we start to recruit these companies that come to this area, that we bring our, our full platform. So we talked about opportunity funds. It's a new one, but we, we're new market tax credits, right? We're 501c3 bonds that we could do. There's all kinds of other tools. Uh, we've worked out to figure out how to, when, when we partner with cities, that they have uh, land that they want to put in a deal on a fair exchange so that we don't get the conservative institutes coming in and attacking us saying, you know, the cities are giving away land. So we've figured all those types of things out. And I'll stop there because I see some hands. Uh, I guess there's a question. I don't know who's, I guess, Vice Mayor, you've been waiting now. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, uh, I think I would direct this uh, question to um, Emilio. Is he here? Yeah. Uh, Emilio, uh, you're talking about enticing uh, what type of investors? You did mention investors and a gathering of business people across the border, and but what type of businesses, what type of uh, investment, investing are you talking about? Well, um, in my conversations with, and I can tell you this because I actually talked to them about um, sharing this information, um, we met with people you probably recognize uh, uh, from with, Nikki, with Nick Kiriakis. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. They have cross-border investments and they work in the U.S. They had no idea that they could ever get a tax benefit. And they do significant investments, not only here, but in other places. Um, another person that was in the meeting was a person by the name of Ricardo Mason, who is um, the owner of many businesses in, in Sonora and throughout Mexico, but he also invests heavily in Arizona and, and in California. And when I chatted with him at, at the same event about uh, potential tax benefits, he was very interested. So the size of the investment is really up to us. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking you to look at us as part of your toolbox, okay? S Nogales needs someone that can provide uh, financial support, loans to, or to companies that might not be able to get it from the bank. They're right on the edge with the mm -hmm. bank where the bank is saying, well, you know, you don't have collateral, your credit history is a little shady, you know, or, or not um, strong enough. That's the, those are the ones that we want to see. Those are the ones that we want. The, we get the referral from the banker, but how can we do that with Nogales? So you make um, the connection. The connection. Also, go and, and present these opportunities to these mm -hmm. investors. So if you have something like the um, um, amphitheater or one of our projects, how can we do how can we go discuss this with them together? Because we can go talk to them, we have a good relationship, et cetera, but if they see the city also accompanying us in this presentation, they're gonna say, okay, they have the city support, the permits aren't gonna be an issue, they're gonna treat us fairly and mm -hmm. respectfully, I wanna invest there. That, that's that's what I'm looking at. Um, Council yes. Thank you. I, Thank you. Again, just to pick up on, on some of the things that you're talking about, Mike Vasquez, who's our financial advisor, he should be here talking to us about the opportunities that exist within your your organization. So there's there's opportunities that are there. We just need to take advantage of looking at other folks that you have on your board. Larry Lucero, who's with TEP, he's always down here talking to us. Ned, Ned Norris, former chair of the Tohono O'odham. We've had relationships with the Tohono O'odham. It'd be nice to have him down here. We'd like to partner with, with the tribal community and, and do things like that because there's there's opportunities of balance. So we just we need to pick up the dialogue and take advantage of the partnerships that already exist. Absolutely, and yes, those are great uh, board members for us and the different committees you could see in in the booklet. And that's that's what we want to do. We 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 made personally. I'll talk about myself as a new CEO. We made the commitment that we wanted to do more in in Southern Arizona, not just Tucson. 
standpoint, I understand that piece. And being from Phoenix, Tucson, also not just Phoenix. So, yeah. so, so all politics are local. But we, I am committed to this, and, and the organization is there. You know, the investment in bringing uh, Valerie on board and having that. So we, we will uh, bring in those, because we don't do anything without partnership. Everything you see in that, those 304,000 people, there's no way we could do that without partners. So that that's what we're going to bring to the table. We're, we're going to be the ones setting it up. And there's other, we've been very good at attracting federal dollars, and I think we can do that in partnership, uh, and the state for that matter, to, to work here in, in Nogales. Well, I, I guess uh, uh, we have one more, another uh, Council Mendoza would like to ask. Yeah, uh, basically, what, what about nonprofit organizations? Uh, what kind of partnerships you do with that? Uh, you know, I'm big in sports. Uh, we need a lot of, lot of uh, complex uh, development. Every year we have more kids playing baseball, soccer, and stuff like that. Uh, you know, I'm uh, part of the Little League, been, been in it for 15 years, and uh, uh, we have a West Regional Tournament over here. Uh, you know, uh, we've been teams from Alaska, Hawaii, Washington, Oregon, and uh, basically we just finished our regional tournament uh, last Thursday. But uh, do you do anything with, uh, in conjunction with uh, non-profit organizations like uh, Miguel's Little League, uh, for instance? We'd be open to looking at something like that. You know, typically we're, we're doing economic development, real estate, and providing our own social services that we do. Uh, but would be open to discussing those, those type of opportunities or, or in, you know, more simplify, you know, to support it in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we'd prefer yeah. to look at something that, you know, what's what's more of a long-term uh, type mm -hmm. of support. But, you know, so the city, I know we have the backing uh, for the kids and stuff like that. Uh, mm -hmm. So if we could get it through, you know, make a change uh, between the city, Little League, and Chicano for the council. Yeah. yeah, even if we don't, uh, do as much directly because you know we, we are a nonprofit ourselves. We can broker stuff. Like we, uh, one of the things that Emilio did recently with our Arizona Mexico Commission Committee, uh, you know, we recently brought over some some children from uh, Emocio, worked with the Diamondbacks to get them to provide some support. So we have other friends, but you, you see the list of the companies that we work with. Uh -huh. We're willing to reach out to them and get them to get more involved. And, and say, you know, will you help us help other markets? So directly, yes, and also indirectly in, in helping bring those other partners that we work with. Because, again, we like to think in abundance and not just think that, you know, the partners that we work is that we're the only ones that they want to help. And so we can bring those types of okay. support mechanisms as well. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, one thing I, I, I kind of want to mention, and uh, I think Dr. Felix is uh, probably the right person to continue to set up the stage for this because uh, last year we, we signed uh, an international or binational actually agreement in economic development with uh, Nogales Sonora and some of those uh, and we're reaching out to those investors and, and, and we have they have a panel over there we have a board here and so Dr. Felix is kind of familiar he's kind of helped organize that and we have it set in place. We, as a matter of fact, uh, we have like the chamber also involved with it, uh, and we have different businessmen uh, here locally that, that are involved either from the produce industry. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Lucero has helped us a little bit to represent the mining industry, and we're bringing all the different industries together so that we can collaborate with uh, and partner up. With investors from both sides of the border working together in, in this area and so i think if you could have a representative join you know our, our uh, board uh that would really help uh, maybe we can even come up with more ideas and i i guess i'll put that in your hands because you're still kind of spearheading that and you have a lot of influence on that so so maybe we can set that up and and, and maybe uh, your local representative can become a, a member with us, and and uh, that way you can all work together with us in that in that sense. And uh, that's, that's, I think that sounds like a good yeah, idea, idea there, Dr. Petty. Oh, absolutely, that's the next step for that. Um, a lot of the income development.
No, no, I appreciate that. And is there any other committee that you think it would be good for us to sit on? Uh, you know, I can volunteer a few people to <laughs> to to serve on serve on those committees if you're offering an opportunity to be appointed to to any of those positions. And the international thing, I'll say, and Emilio had something he wanted to add as well. So again, to put it in more simple terms, we we tell people it, to work with us. It's a matter of whether you like what we do and you want to work with us. You know, if you have grant money, great. But if you need a return on your investment, we have a menu, right? And what I'd like to do with uh, Nogales in the future. So our next new market tax credit application, right? Because we we get we got 30 million the last time that we applied. We just applied again. I'd love to be able to work to identify projects so that we can include that. Because quite frankly, you you score better if you include rural communities uh, in the states. So I'd, on this committee, I'd love to you know sit down and we target you know what are your guys' priorities here in the city, uh, economic development projects, and include those in, in those applications. And other federal grants, we were very, very good of, of finding those little hidden treasures in the federal government, whether it's EDA or, you know, we find workforce money in, in OCS and, you know, we can do the alphabet soup of all the departments. We, we have a, a top-notch resource development group that we would love. Once we understand what's, what's, your, what's your goals and objectives and your projects that you have in your portfolio, then we can start matching it up and matching the team members on it so that we can go after it, both domestically and internationally. Because what, what I tell the people when, when Emilio and, and Cesar, Cesar, we go down to Mexico, I basically say, if you've got a US tax burden, you can work with us. And I've got a tool for you to work with based on our menu of, of financial products that we have that we work with to bring that investment here. Emilio, did you want to add something on that? As long as I'm not the one that closes, boss. You got to close. Oh, OK. All right. <laughs> Um, this is, uh, CPLC is here, we're in Southern Arizona, we have a, a significant presence. I, I understand, uh, Councilman Lucero, that um, the volunteer presence and that type of thing needs to improve. And I can tell you that when Valerie called me and shared what she was expecting from me um, in this meeting, she also said, Emilio, I need your commitment to Nogales. And I need you to commit to me that if, you know, these things, you know, surface and these opportunities start to look like it's something that we need to engage in, I need your commitment to make sure that we're doing that. So um, I, I can tell you that you have our commitment from, from the business enterprises uh, department, but this is real. Our real estate department has built over 200 homes in this area. We're, we're significant contributors to this area. How can we improve it is uh, what... I would like to ask, and hopefully this type of session, working with a city manager and working with you, um, some of you I know, they're great friends. I, like I said, I love Nogales. In fact, I was here three years ago when and spoke at the signing of the sister cities agreement between Nogales and Nogales. And there I talked about economic development and what can be done. So I've seen some things become <coughs> reality, and um, CPLC can definitely be a partner in this, in this path and this journey, and we can have a lot of fun at the same time. So again, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for allowing me to speak again and for inviting me. Yeah, no, oh, I, one more question from. Uh, well, I don't have a question. It's, it, it's a comment before you bring closure to Mr. Adami. I just want to make a comment that uh, I was very intrigued with your your theme, my community connects, and how you describe what you have here. But I would hope that you could get together before you leave today with our city manager because you just canceled a garbage collection from one of your apartment complexes, if I'm not mistaken, with us. And we would like to continue that partnership. We need that partnership. We've lost some commercial. We can't afford to lose commercial garbage collection accounts. So I hope you would meet with our city manager and go over that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first off, thank you again for, for your time. And um, as it was mentioned before, our whiteboard sessions are usually around a table with a lot of markers and post-its everywhere. And obviously, this is maybe not the, the best environment for that. But we certainly, uh, you know, invite this innovative, 
conversation, dialogue to take place that really is aligned with the, and we're cognizant of the strategic plan that you all have been working, in, working on, working in, working within for a very long time. So we are definitely not here to tell you that we have all the answers. We are asking to share information with you, to ask that um, you consider us a partner in the future. Um, going back to the purpose and the uh, initial intent of Chicanos por la Causa was the advocacy piece, and there was a need. Uh, that being said, the need still exists in various areas. We've talked about pillars, but also from an advocacy standpoint, outreach, engagement is very important, community engagement. I hear um, and I'm and, and very much listening and cognizant of, of your comments, Councilman Maldonado, because I know on a very local level, those needs of community, of children, of athletics, um, as well as, of course, education. Um, those are there's so many areas that we can really hone in on. And then, of course, prioritize, right? So not creating a whole new different plan, but really how can we help align your plan with perhaps some of the work and the resources that we offer? by being a connector. One of the first ways that I'd like to offer is as being uh, new to the position here where I would love to be able to work closer and, and intend to do that is uh, by way of the Cyclovia event. We'll be here, we'll be engaged, we'll be uh, tabling and whatever we can do to bring our staff to volunteer. I know Corina, again, she's very much involved in community through our self-help program. So we are gonna be here more often. You'll be seeing us. In addition to that, I would absolutely welcome the opportunity for board inclusion from the city of Nogales and based on your recommendations collectively and we will certainly follow up with Dr. Felix. Are there any questions before we close and, and ask him when our next meeting will be? <laughs> uh, I'll just have a comment before you go ahead and maybe what you think about the next meeting. But uh, another, another resource that we could tap in and I think they could really uh, would love to to jump jump in and help us out, if, especially if we partner up. Is uh, the uh, there's a couple divisions within the Arizona Com Commerce Authority, mm -hmm. the, the rural, which we we're here, and also the international side of it. So there's funding on both of those divisions for some joint effort like ours, it, it, and, and that'd be a good resource to tap into. Piggybacking on that comment. That is another area and a resource. As David mentioned, we have an excellent resource development team. Based on your needs and possible funding, we could align ourselves together and really take a look to see how we can best support your efforts in perhaps doing so together. So, absolutely. Thank you very much for your time today. No, I'd like to thank uh, CPLC and all the individuals that came down. I'd like to maintain contact with you and have our whiteboards in the office and get some projects on the table as soon as possible. So Thank you so much. Our offices are open to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> we, we really want to thank you, Chicanos for la Casa, for bringing the whole team over and and really kind of uh, break, uh, kind, kind of cutting forth uh, you know, pioneering the path here for, you know, setting up something that we can all work together. I, I think it'll be very fruitful for this uh, rural area of, of ours, and we thank you for supporting us. <coughs> you know, I, I know that it's been kind of, I think since you were in, a, uh, before you were city manager already, we were kind of working on economic development, and we had some talks before uh, last year, and, and uh, you know, I'm really glad to see the doctors now He's our, our, our city manager, and so a lot, a lot, a lot of the footwork has already been done. So I'm, I'm hoping that we can get off to a running start to this. And I'll, I'll, I think that, like the rest of the council said, we're going to kind of put it in, in the doctor's hands, and, and uh, we'll be, we'll be supportive of, of uh, making that joint effort. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And. I guess uh, we've got, uh, I believe, a short, uh, a short uh, kind of presentation. Uh, I guess uh, uh, you're the one that's going to let us know or kind of uh, 
introduction to an idea, more than likely, uh, by number C, by Mr. Cesar Verduzco on uh, sports uh, promotion. Um, I was uh, my name is Cesar Barbusco. Um, I'm the Olympic coordinator here for the Mexican Olympic Committee for the U.S. and also represent. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> well, uh, my name is Cesar Verduzco. Thank you, Mayor, for inviting me to be part of this committee. Thank you, Council Members. Uh, and a few uh, couple uh, year ago, we happened to be with the Mayor in Mexico City. Uh, we exchanged uh, conversation there. How can we attract economic development here to, to the city of Nogales? So when we start talking and, and getting to know each other, I got an idea, uh, suddenly I got an idea. I said, why we don't, uh, why we don't do some uh, 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 d uh, Olympic tournaments right here in the city of Nogales? Uh, I'm the coordinator here for the Mexican Olympic Committee, and also I uh, represent the WBC. The, the, the World Boxing Council. He just named me uh, for the state of Arizona, Nevada, and uh, non-Nevada, I'm sorry, state of Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. So connecting the dots, I say, you know what? I, having the experience, uh, games always attract economy uh, uh, development because there's people that spend money to come here. They go stay in hotels, they go shopping, they eat. So also, I notice uh, uh, in some cases, some people come for a tournament, and they re they realize that's an opportunity for the businesses here. So I'm talking with the mayor, I say I have the solution. You know why we don't uh, do some tournaments here, international tournaments that will attract and put the city of Nogales in the map. You know, uh, internationally in the border, especially you have a. a, a uh, MOU with the city of Nogales, Sonora, so we can help. We can ask them to help us to to promote uh, such uh, events. All oh, right there. Thank you. And and and, and attract some uh, 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 medalists, Olympic medalists, that they will help to to bring that uh, that uh, propaganda to the city of Nogales. And so I prepare a little, uh, uh, I say, uh, a presentation there, you know, for you that I can go in details maybe next time, you know, this gloss. But I want to show you a, just a small teaser, uh, a video that was pretty much sell everything, the idea, what I have. And it connects per, uh, very well with the first uh, presentation with the park that you have. You just have that uh, amphitheater. We can have cultural events there, Olympics, uh, medalists, and even uh, uh, mariachi or, or folklore dancing. Yes, uh, uh, you know? Can you all please settle down? We're having okay. a presentation right now. So please keep it quiet until we start. That uh, video is going to really reason, sell please, uh, my concept. Uh, Thank you. Uh, like I was <laughs> Mayor John Doe, John I'm the guy who can make it happen, and he knows why. Because uh, uh, the president of the Olympic Committee He's my father-in-law, so I had a power, a that leverage, <laughs> and also he's the president of the Pan American Games, so we, I can attract even from all American. All right, so I'm going to show you a teaser there, so what I have in mind for the city of Nogales, I hope you enjoy and I, you value it. One last thing, David, that I mean, forgot that, that he, he signed an MOU with the Olympic Committee. So oh, here's good. that. Good. So, so it, it, it's all kind of related. Mm -hmm. This just happened a month and a half ago in LA. So this give you the picture of what we can do here. Okay. Thank you. Welcome everyone. Uh, we're we're almost at the end of a presentation. You, would, you might tune in, and it's kind of interesting matter for the community. So. Again, welcome for, I know you're here for the regular meeting, but uh, we're almost done. Well, 
to explain th this video, there were people coming from different countries to LA, from uh, IT, Mexico, of course. What's the biggest? 200 kids. Hundreds of young boxers came from all over California and different states like Georgia, Massachusetts, Arizona, and even from Paris. This is the great show and we can come out to you. The show is free for all boxers and families with a very positive atmosphere for everyone to enjoy. It was hosted by the World Boxing Council, the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, Music. Well, I can email you the, the presentation so you can see the value. So it was a great turnaround, three days, and attract a lot of economic development, money, spending money. to bring in champs. Evander Holyfield is already, he said he would like to be part of it. So former champ is going to come here. So that's going to be the magnet to attract this kind of population. We have two youth bouts this year. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. I can share the same day video. Maybe next time we can talk more. Okay. Uh, okay? Uh, it's something that we'd probably be interested. Maybe we can get together with a doctor and then and then do another presentation of, uh, uh, of, the, of the finished product on, on how we can uh, promote Nogales with uh, We need to do sport. it, I know. It's a great potential here. It's perfect. We partner with Nogales Sonora. We bring these people here and we do, this is one of the, uh, of the disciplines that we can do. We can do it a lot more and especially with the project you have in the well, we, we, we appreciate, we know you have the connections and we'd like to continue to explore that. So, uh, we'll be in touch uh, with you, Mr. Rezuso. Thank you. And, and thank you for thank coming you, over. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We'll get together and follow up on it. Thank you so much. Uh, I guess uh, <clears throat> we're at the at the end of our presentation, uh, and so we have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Right. Second. Uh, all together. Second five or saying aye. Aye. Uh, study session adjourned. Thank you. We'll take a five minute break and go into our regular session. Uh, thank you. Thank you. We're almost we're almost there. Thank you so much.